Professor Ferguson, good afternoon. Uh, it's good a very, afternoon. It's a great joy and a great honor to have you with us, even uh, from such a distance. I remember last year you had this interview with uh, the Prime Minister Hirakos Mitsotakis, and at the end of, of the interview, you expressed the hope that uh, this year you would come in Athens, but uh, this wasn't possible. Uh, I hope next year we'll see you. Uh, well, uh, well next, next year I very much hope to be with you, and I guess it's a sign uh, of the reality that pandemics tend to last longer than one year, that we're still having to rely on uh, the internet. But I just wanted to draw your attention to uh, the watch that I'm wearing, uh, which is a watch specially designed uh, to commemorate uh, the 200th anniversary of, of Greek independence. Uh, so I'm, Great. <laughs> I'm there in spirit, not in body. Great. I am afraid that we are not going to talk about the, 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 the 200 years from the, <laughs> from the revolution, but um, we're not going to talk even about the pandemic, although your, 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 your last book, which is called Doom, uh, the Politics of uh, Catastrophe, isn't it so? It's about the pandemic, but uh, uh, I think we should uh, stick to the subject of, uh, of, 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 of this chat of this interview, of this discussion, whatever it is. And uh, this subject is about uh, Trump and the Trumpism. But still, before I get into this main uh, subject, I cannot help to ask you if you agree with this, uh, I would say, Biden mania, uh, this recent Biden mania, even this, his comparison with, uh, with Franklin Roosevelt that is made by set, uh, several uh, commentators, or whether you believe that this is, uh, could be exaggerated. <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll begin by uh, showing you the book itself uh, because I think it's, it's relevant to what I'm about to tell you. Uh, the image of a golfer trying to sink a putt with a wildfire raging behind him kind of summed up America in 2020 for me. The thing about being president is that you don't necessarily get to choose the disaster you have to deal with. And I think one of the dangers of the media enthusiasm uh, for Joe Biden is that uh, there seems to be some amnesia about the presidencies of Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson. I've heard uh, Joe Biden repeatedly compared with FDR and LBJ as a transformational president, what they have in mind, I think, is that his domestic agenda is very ambitious. And certainly in terms of the price tag of the various plans that are currently uh, envisaged, uh, we're talking big money, nearly $6 trillion in total by my calculation. And it's true that uh, this could compare with the New Deal in the 1930s and with the Great Society of the 1960s. But let's not forget what happened later in the presidencies of Roosevelt and Johnson, uh, because uh, Johnson's presidency was destroyed uh, by the Vietnam War. And I, I think it's very dangerous to draw comparisons and invite uh, analogies with the Johnson administration because it began with a bold domestic agenda and ended in a foreign policy debacle. And one other thing I'll add, the Roosevelt and Johnson administrations had huge majorities in both houses of Congress. And Joe Biden does not. He has a wafer-thin majority. Actually, it's a tie broken by the vice president uh, in the Senate, and the majority in the House is far, far smaller than in the 1930s and the 1960s. So I think these comparisons illustrate a problem with much media coverage in the United States. It's hopelessly partisan. And whether it's the New York Times or CNN or the Washington Post, there seems to be some strange belief on the part of many American journalists today that their role is to be activists uh, on behalf of an administration they like, 
just as they were activists against an administration that they didn't like after 2016. And I don't think that's how journalism should work. Do, uh, actually, you are right about uh, this thin majority. I was reading today that um, some Democrats are, 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 are shifting. I'm not, it's not very sure that they will uh, vote everything that uh, President Biden wants. But what I want to ask you also is, do you, do you believe also that President Biden is in some matters following what Trump did? Because that's what also some commentators said. For example, the, the ban of exports of vaccines, or the withdrawal from Afghanistan, or the strong position towards uh, China. Is there really a theory? Well, the theory of continuity in American politics exists. We know it. But does it, uh, does it, uh, is it also true between Obama and Trump and Trump and Biden? Well, Donald Trump was very much a discontinuity in uh, policy, both in domestic and uh, foreign policy. After uh, many decades of uh, free trade policies, Donald Trump was an avowed protectionist. After decades dating back to the 1970s of seeking to partner with China, Donald Trump embarked on a strategy of competition uh, and even uh, sometimes close to conflict with China. And the Biden administration has very uh, deliberately taken that policy uh, towards China and continued it. The trade war has not been canceled. The tariffs have not been reduced. Moreover, the tone of the Biden administration on a broad range of issues, uh, notably human rights in Hong Kong and Xinjiang and the U.S. commitment to Taiwan is even more hawkish, actually, than the Trump administration was. Because remember, Donald Trump played hardball because he wanted to do a deal. His hope, if he'd been re-elected, was to cut a deal with Xi Jinping. Donald Trump didn't really care very much about democracy in Hong Kong, whereas the Biden administration not only talks very similar talk, uh, it actually is far more sincere in what it says on issues such as human rights uh, and democracy. So we have a very marked continuity uh, towards, uh, in policy towards China. And I think that's one of the most striking features of this new administration. Uh, after all, if this had been a restoration of the Obama era, uh, then there would have been a complete reversal of, of, of policy on China. There has been, or is going to be, a significant reversal of policy in the Middle East. It's pretty clear that the uh, Biden folks want to resuscitate the Iran nuclear deal and walk away from the Abraham Accords that, that, that were achieved under the Trump uh, administration. So they can change direction if they want to, but on the key issue, the number one geopolitical issue of our time, which is China, uh, there really is a very striking continuity. Clearly on domestic policies, there is a, a discontinuity. The Trump administration uh, cut taxes uh, on corporations uh, and on wealthier individuals, and the, and the Biden administration seems determined to raise taxes. So on, on fiscal uh, issues, there's, there's clearly a discontinuity. On the other hand, both the Trump and Biden administrations have absolutely no interest in seeing the federal budget, and the deficits extend as far as the eye can see on an even larger scale than under Trump. Give us a prediction. I know you like predictions and you like to provoke. Give me a prediction in, 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 in two words. Is he going to run again in, in three years? Trump, I mean. I expect he will because he not only uh, does he uh, want to come back, but a very substantial proportion of Republican voters want him on the ticket. He is, at this point, the presumptive nominee because polling shows he's far ahead of any of the other contenders. So the only thing that would stop this happening uh, would be the Grim Reaper. Uh, but Donald Trump proved to be as uh, physically uh, strong as he is uh, 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 mentally aggressive. And I think that having walked through uh, COVID-19, which seemed barely to impact his health, uh, he's not like to uh, oblige his Republican rivals 
uh, by dropping dead before uh, 2024. So I, I'm assuming that he will be uh, the candidate. And I also assume that he uh, will not win if he is the candidate. Uh -huh. And he controls totally the Republican Party. I was, I was reading an article by Edward uh, Lewis in the Financial Times the other, the, the other day where he said, he wrote about the death throes of American conservatism. He said that the Republican Party is now built around whatever Trump says, however ab absurd it is. And uh, we follow and the story of Liz Cheney, who Donald Trump tries to, tries to remove from, from the party. So uh, do you think that we can we possibly see this end of conservatism in, in, in uh, the United States and even in Europe, if, if, I, if I may ask. I mean, we see in Europe recently uh, personalities from the right that are not <clears throat> of center right, but are, 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 are more extreme, like the, the, the winner of the recent uh, elections in Madrid. And so I'm wondering uh, which are, who are the natural allies of, of, of Kyriakos Mitsotakis, for example, in, uh, in, in, in Europe? I suppose not not uh, Isabella Ayuso in Madrid, uh, not, of course, the Italian uh, extreme right, but I, I, have, I have the feeling that his allies are more uh, towards the, the, the Green candidate, for example, from Germany. I don't know your view about, about it. I'm well, mixing things, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> two very different questions, so let yeah. me take them yeah. one by one. Uh, First, one should never follow American politics through the pages of the Financial Times, uh, much <laughs> as I admire uh, Ed Luce and, and other commentators in the FT. I think it, it wasn't the place to go to try to understand uh, the elections of 2016 or indeed of, of 2020. And, and I think one of the things that people keep missing in their uh, indignation about Donald Trump is the extent to which he is a vote winner. Now, it's true that, uh, that he lost in, uh, in 2020, of course. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, the turnout in that election, uh, it was a really very high turnout election. And the Trump campaign succeeded in mobilizing a lot of voters in minority groups that uh, really previous candidates had struggled to, to mobilize, that the Republican Party's future cannot be a... Uh, as a, a whites-only uh, conservative party that primarily focuses on lowering taxes on the rich. And I think Trump's uh, ability to reach out and attract Hispanic voters on cultural uh, as well as economic issues should not be underestimated. Remember, if things go wrong under Joe Biden, and I think they will because I think they're overheating the economy in a way that even Larry Summers, a former Democratic Treasury Secretary, thinks is reckless, uh, then there is going to be a, a backlash, not amongst the elites who will continue to act as cheerleaders in the media and elsewhere for Biden, but I think amongst ordinary voters. And that's why it's premature to, to write uh, Trump off as a political force. Uh, it's, it's difficult to see who in uh, Republican Party politics could be as effective a mobilizer uh, of across the uh, the political spectrum as as Trump, so they they kind of have to accept that uh, these commentators that the reason Trump lost was COVID nineteen. That's why he lost. Uh, if it had not been for the pandemic and his notable mishandling of it, he would have been reelected. Uh, and even with a catastrophic pandemic and an economic crisis to match it. The, the, the Republicans did not do badly. Uh, they did not do badly in the Senate races. They only lost the Senate because I think they mishandled uh, the runoff uh, elections in Georgia. And the Democrats lost seats in the House. So when one's reading uh, the, the liberal uh, elite commentary on Trump, there, there are two mistakes that those commentators make time and again. The first is to predict a systemic crisis of American politics. And I lost count of the number of articles I read over the last five years that said if Trump were president, the system would crash and the republic would be like the Weimar Republic of the 1920s. Well, that, that turned out to be nonsense. The system withstood the Trump presidency pretty much intact. And uh, even the craziness of January the 6th 
can't really be regarded as a profound threat to American democracy, on the contrary. So I think that's the, set, the first thing they get wrong. And the second thing they get wrong is, is that they underestimate the enduring appeal of Trump's brand of populism, uh, which combines economic uh, protectionism uh, with a, a tough national security stance on, on China uh, and, of course, a populist cultural message. This is not going away, especially, as I said, if things begin to go wrong between now and 2024, as I suspect they almost inevitably will. Remember, the economy could overheat. The immigration could be a serious one. They don't know what to do about that. Uh, and there's a crime wave, which is getting more and more attention in American cities, especially those under democratic control. You asked a second question, which is really about European politics. And a major realignment is clearly underway in European politics. Uh, notably in Germany, where it's clear that the CDU's reign is coming to an end, and we may find ourselves with a Green-led coalition uh, by the end oh, no. of the year. Uh, I think if you look at the UK, you can see part of a wider pattern, the decline of uh, social democratic parties. Uh, the old socialist model is basically dying in Europe, and that creates, I think, opportunities uh, for a centrist conservatism of the sort that Kyriakos Mitsotakis personifies. People don't want socialism, but they don't want the populist uh, right uh, uh, of, uh, say, Matteo Salvini in Italy either. That, that's been a very striking feature of the last year or so. So it's early days in this realignment, and I think it'll take a while for, uh, for counterparts to Kyriakos to emerge. Uh, but I'm confident that they will, because the moderate conservatism is actually the most attractive uh, politics in a Europe that really needs to get its act together, uh, both economically, in terms of public health, uh, as well as in addressing fundamental challenges, not only climate change, but the challenges to European security posed by Russia and, of course, uh, as you've discussed in previous sessions, by Turkey. Mm -hmm. To, to come back to the United States and actually to your book, uh, I didn't have the chance to, to read the whole book, but uh, I, I remember in a certain chapter, you are very strong, your criticism is very strong against ex-President Obama, uh, both for his uh, foreign policy, for his failure in Syria, where he failed to intervene when chemical weapons were used by, by Assad, but also in the social sector. You, you are writing about these deaths of despair, these, uh, uh, the three waves of opioid overdoses, which is very impressive. And what you are writing is, I quote, though the media assigned almost no blame to Obama for his administration's failure to deal with the opioid epidemic, such social trends did much to explain Donald Trump's success as a populist outsider in 2016, first in winning the Republican nomination, then in defeating Hillary Clinton to win the presidency itself. So uh, I suppose that uh, you believe that uh, perhaps you agree with, uh, with uh, Michael Sandel's criticism, who in his recent book, I'm actually translating the book, about the tyranny of merit writes that Obama and Clinton and uh, Tony Blair and all these elites uh, uh, were, uh, did not uh, uh, behave well to the losers of, uh, of globalization. And this led to phenomena like uh, the uh, Trump selection, like Brexit, like the Les le Gilets Jaunes in, in France. Well, with all due respect to Michael Sandel and his translator, this argument was made a long time ago, much more uh, presciently, as opposed to after the fact, uh, by Charles Murray in his book Coming Apart, mm -hmm. uh, where he correctly identified that the polarization in American society between a wealthy and academically selected elite and the great mass of, of white uh, working class Americans was more extreme than at any time in modern American history. Uh, coming apart made those arguments, I think I'm right in saying in 2011 or 2012, uh, before a Trump had emerged as the uh, spear carrier or flag carrier of this populist movement. I mean, I think if one looks back on the Obama presidency, two things stand out. 
Uh, one is that uh, there were a succession of, of foreign policy blunders, uh, principally over Syria, but I think also over Ukraine, that greatly weakened the credibility of the United States uh, with respect uh, to Russia, uh, as well as, I think, with respect uh, to China, the real rival that the United States now faces. And secondly, there was a disaster which was measurable in uh, life expectancy uh, in middle America. As Angus Dayton uh, showed, uh, mortality uh, trends were worsening uh, for non-Hispanic white Americans in uh, middle age. Uh, many of those premature deaths were happening because of the opioid epidemic, which actually killed as many people over the eight years Obama was in power as COVID did in the last year of the Trump presidency. And yet I don't remember anybody blaming uh, the opioid uh, epidemic on, on Barack Obama, despite the fact that it really didn't happen in other countries and was wow. a peculiarly American phenomenon, and despite the fact that it got worse every year of the Obama presidency, it entirely failed to deal with that homegrown epidemic. And I think that just illustrates a point that I made earlier, that there's a terrible asymmetry in the way that presidencies are now covered by significant parts uh, of the media. So if, 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 we had, if we have to, to, to identify the roots of Trumpism, which is the title of our, of our discussion as well, where would the balance uh, go? To identitarian factors, uh, the fear of the end of white uh, dominancy, or to ideological factors, migration, economy, and so on? Well, I used to say, for simplicity's sake, sort of half uh, economics and, and half culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and the economics, I, I think, uh, mattered a lot because if you look at the, the fate of the median household, uh, it really went on a round trip between 1999 and, and 2016 uh, with, with almost no gains over that period in real household uh, income and a huge shock in 2008, 2009, because of the financial crisis. Uh, of course, plenty of wealthy people voted for Trump too. And, uh, a lot of uh, the poorest uh, Americans uh, did not. So you can't explain uh, all of Trumpism in economic terms. But I think when Trump said that he wanted to dial back globalization and reduce uh, immigration, uh, that struck a chord, even with people who were not worse off. The key thing is not how you feel, it's how you're going to feel. And if one looks at uh, uh, survey data from 2015, 2016, there were people who'd done okay in the pre previous few years who still were very worried about their future and their kids' future. And that pessimism was w w what Trump was able to tap uh, with this idea of American carnage. Uh, but the, the culture is more important, I think, uh, uh, on balance, but only slightly. Uh, and, and I think it's important not to confuse uh, the cultural uh, variables here. I don't think Trumpism is primarily about race, although it's a recurring talking point on the left uh, that Trumpism is just a vehicle for white supremacy. I, I think that's terribly insulting uh, to the Americans who voted for Trump. In reality, uh, a really quite small minority uh, indeed, almost a tiny number of people can be identified as, as true white supremacists or, or neo-Nazis. Uh, a rounding error in terms of the number of people who voted for Trump in 2016 uh, and 2020. The cultural issues that motivate Americans uh, to vote uh, Trump, I don't think are straightforwardly to do with race. They have much more to do with a kind of disillusionment with the ideals of a liberal elite that's become completely out of touch. Uh, there's certainly a lot of frustration in middle America with ideas uh, that have gone from affirmative action in favor of minorities to outright and explicit discrimination in favor of, of minorities and therefore against uh, white uh, candidates uh, for jobs. Uh, there is great disillusionment with the ideas that are now dominant in American education, critical race theory, anti-racism, and all that kind of thing. That the trick that the left plays is to come up with slogans like anti-racism and challenge you to be against it. Because, of course, if you're against it, then you must be a racist. 
But anybody who knows what's going on in American schools and universities knows that there's a very illiberal streak, a hostility to free speech, a uh, hostility to free spot, so, uh, thought and free association that is deeply un-American. And that's the kind of thing that I think people are alienated about. Uh, it's a mistake to characterize it as, as racist because many uh, Hispanic uh, Americans uh, and many African Americans share this disillusionment with wokeism uh, in their schools. And I think that that's going to be a really important factor in the coming years because this problem has not gone away. Indeed, the woke left, the progressive left, is going to be even stronger uh, under Joe Biden uh, than it's ever been. And uh -huh. already we see all kinds of encouragement uh, to those elements uh, in the form of, of presidential executive orders. And, and that, I think, is going to fuel a, a recovery of American conservatism, because I think there are legitimate reasons to be very, very worried about what's going on in American education. It cannot be healthy for American society for kids to be told that the defining characteristic uh, of uh, uh, is racism, that the first part of the story is the wickedness of slavery, the second part is the wickedness of Jim Crow, and the third part is the great uh, salvation of civil rights, which of course is not yet fully achieved. That, that can't be the narrative of, Amer of American history that kids in American schools and colleges are, told, are taught. And, and that's, I, that's the kind of thing that I think Trumpism tapped into. And I think it can be tapped into by future leaders. It doesn't need to be Donald Trump. And I think at some point, someone else will take his place. And I hope it will be somebody who's a more effective uh, politician, because as we saw in the crisis of COVID-19, although Donald Trump was a showman who mastered social media, he was an incompetent in the face of a national public health emergency. And that, as I said, is why he lost. I have around 100 more questions to ask you, but I'm afraid that <laughs> we don't have time. So I hope, I really hope next year we can, uh, we can, we can meet, uh, <laughs> really. I want to thank you very much, Professor Ferguson, for this uh, discussion uh, and uh, wish you the best. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. And I wish everybody in Delphi a very, very enjoyable conference, whether you're there in, pres in, uh, in physical presence or, or doing this via, uh, via the internet. Thanks again. Thank you.